what is the difference and how do you tell as a parent the difference between PDA autism or more classic autism with demand avoidance? Okay, so I'm gonna take a minute, more than a minute, to explain this from my perspective as if we were talking in a coaching call um, to you as a parent. This was the question I received. My answer would be much different if I were speaking to a clinician. So just keep that in mind. So again, the question is, how do I know if my child is PDA autistic or autistic with demand avoidance? Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> All right. So I've written down my notes because I want to make this a little training. Okay. So the first thing I would think about as a parent is whether the survival drive for autonomy that the child has or the drive for autonomy is the primary driver for their behavior and overrides other instincts and other drivers of behavior. So let's ground this with an example. So every brain, especially neurodivergent brains, has a lot of complex dimensions, right? And PDA children are autistic, so they also have social communication differences, they also have sensory differences, and many autistic children have a high need for autonomy. So how do we parse this? In the case of a PDA child, that drive for autonomy is going to override other po potentially conflicting access needs. So maybe a child who is PDA is bothered by a sound, but when you suggest to them the headphones, because that's perceived by their amygdala as a loss of autonomy, that you're suggesting it, they're gonna resist that even though they have that sensory need, whereas a more classic autistic profile, the need for the sensory support might be higher than that need for autonomy, okay? So it's always looking at like what is the primary driver not black and white of like, oh, they're autistic and so they don't have a demand avoidance or oh, they're PDA and therefore they don't have autistic traits, right? We wanna think in terms of lenses and like what the drivers are and root causes and what um, is gonna override what. So other things to look at, um, special interests or monotropic focus, for example. In a more classic autistic profile, you're going to see maybe enduring special interests, like the classic one would be trains. Like my younger son, um, he trains and trucks, trains and trucks. From the day he like started playing with trains or uh, playing with toys, it was always trains and trucks. Whereas a PDA child will have rotating special interests because it can become an internal loss of autonomy playing with the same toy, right? Or having that same interest becomes a perceived demand or loss of autonomy. So you're going to see patterns of like, they're really into Bakugan for three months and then they're, they drop it all together. And then they're really into Pokemon and then they drop it all together. Okay. So you're going to see those differences. You're also going to, you're going to see more need for novelty and control. And again, these are these are ways of thinking about it. This isn't diagnostic criteria. And I'm going to caveat all this with a very important question back to the person who asked me this. So let me give you an example of my son's experience with eating. So his occupational therapist has said the patterns she's seen with him and other PDA children she's worked with don't reflect other autistic children, and here's why. When they're working on incorporating new foods, for example, they might work through the sensory lens, and so my son will get over the avoidance of something because he doesn't like the taste or he doesn't like the smell. You know, from he'll try it and like it, but then he'll drop something else, right? Because there's that control element and, and maintaining autonomy. Whereas like, if you're just working through a sensory lens, the kid gets used to something and then they expand their repertoire, right? But remember that like that internal loss of autonomy is also a large driver. It's not just us as parents taking away autonomy, it's also the perception that societal expectations and even internal routines can become 
a demand or a perceived loss of autonomy. So um, the last thing, oh, the constant need for co-regulation is another pattern difference that I see. And you can, you've probably sensed this if you've interacted with parents who have autistic children who are not PDA because they don't have a nervous system disability, which means the autistic child might be able to play independently and engage in activities that they're interested in without having that undivided attention and nervous system scaffolding that parents provide. Okay, so these are just sort of anecdotal things to think about as a parent. And but I want to emphasize like, there are lots of reasons for demand avoidance. And brains are complex, whether they're neurotypical or neurodivergent, right? So, you know, someone and your child inclusive as a PDA child could be avoiding something because of preference, because they have trauma around it, because of executive functioning, because of sensory, or because of that perceived loss of autonomy or balance, right? And so an example of this is like, sometimes I avoid taking out the crap that I wash off the dishes, you know, I wash the dishes and then it gets stuck in the drain. And it's like, I avoid it, right? And if you're looking at me from the outside, you have no idea why, right? It could be like, Casey hates doing the dishes and taking out that crap from the sink because it's a preference. Or she, maybe she's ADHD and has executive functioning differences and she like keeps forgetting. Or, maybe my husband said, Casey, can you wash the dishes? And I perceive that as a loss of autonomy and he's above me, he's putting himself above me. So I'm like threat response, fight or flight, avoid. Or I just really hate the feeling and the sensation of the stuff in the sink. Or maybe one time when I was a kid, you know, or continually while I was a kid, I was made to wash the dishes and take the things out of the sink. And it, for some reason, whatever was going on in my childhood created trauma. Okay, so from the outside looking in, we're seeing avoidance, but we don't always know the root cause. And even PDA children can have different root causes for what's going on. The key with the PDA children is we have to respond the same way. But what I really wanna emphasize here, and why most of you are probably here, is because you have tried a million things around executive functioning, preferences, social communication, sensory, right? And they haven't worked. And so what I really wanna say back to the parent who asked this question with the utmost compassion is like, in some ways it doesn't matter. What you really wanna tune into is like, is what you're doing working for your child? And often that's how we know, that's how we know if it is something more than sensory, if it is something more than like needing social communication supports, because if we apply those things and we see increasing dysregulation, then we have to try something different, which is why we're here thinking through the autonomy and nervous system lens. And so again, like the internal experience of the child, especially when they're younger, we're not going to know it until we establish that safety and that relationship and connection. That's why I always focus on that. Um, but ultimately, the question is, back to you guys is like, is it helping your child? Is your child thriving what you're doing? Like if, if a pediatrician is telling you to do something, and you're doing it, is it working? Is your child thriving? How do you feel in your body when you're applying the techniques, right? Of like being stricter or more classic autism supports like laminated charts, right? And ultimately we wanna hone in on what our indicators are as parents, which I think for all of us is long-term well-being, mental and physical health and a child who's thriving to the best of their ability Whereas a lot of the therapists and educators and, and pediatricians we're working with are really focused on like, are they complying in the moment? Are they achieving this developmental milestone? Are they reading on time, right? And so I want you guys to pan out or the person who had this question to pan out and really think about like, if you're working through a classic autism lens and it's not working 
or are you even defining how it's working in a way that aligns with you, right? For me, it became, I don't care if they're complying in a classroom. I don't care if they're complying in the moment if what I'm seeing on the level of basic needs, engagement in the world around them, and behavior is going completely off the rails and like my son is not well, right? And so we always, and I want you to, also apply this lens with what I suggest, right? Like if I suggest something and you apply it and it's like, oh, that didn't work for my kid. It doesn't mean you're not doing it right. It means like we tune in to like, okay, this particular application of the, of the accommodation isn't the right fit for my child. It doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with your child. It just means we have to take that as evidence, right? We have to take it as data. And so that's what I want to say to this mom who asked this question of, you know, of course there are some things to look at, but ultimately what matters is what helps your child. And so I often encourage parents to start applying some of the accommodations and then observing, does it help, right? And does it help in terms of like your connection with them? Does it help in terms of their basic needs access? Like, are they sleeping better? Are they eating more? And of course that's long term. So that is what I want to say in response to that wonderful parent question. I hope that was helpful and thank you guys for joining. So fun to be with you. Um, and I hope you guys have a good rest of your day. Bye.